1 Corinthians chapter 7 is a great chapter. It has a lot to do with um, marriage and singles and, and things like that, and a lot of great truths found in this chapter. What I'm going to be preaching about this morning is biblical dating principles. Now, you could say, Pastor Burzins, I'm married. You know, I stopped dating a long time ago. Well, don't worry because you, there's still a lot to learn or at least to be reminded of in this passage, whether you're married or not, because we're going to go over, like this, I said, the name of my, the, the title of my sermon is Principles. We're going to be going over principles, and a lot of the principles we're going to be going over this morning are principles that are also going to be well applied to married couples as well. Um, we go to the scripture for everything that we believe, for everything that we should be doing, for the guidance, for the light, for the instruction on how we ought to live our lives on a daily basis. And there's many times where everything is very clearly spelled out on you don't do this and you do this, right? We don't have much of a problem identifying those things. There's other areas of our life, just in general, day-to-day -day life, that isn't quite as clearly spelled out on a step-by-step -step basis. So what we have to rely on are principles, things that we know are wrong or things that we know are right, and then be able to apply our actions, what we do, just how we live our life to, to coincide with those core teachings. And um, dating is no different. So we want to make sure that, that what, how we handle ourselves when it comes to dating um, will line up with the teachings that we can see very clearly in Scripture. And, you know, we have, um, whether or not you're married, you know, like I said, or maybe you're not dating, maybe you are dating, maybe you're coming, you know, you have kids that are going to be close to dating. Uh, very important, or maybe, you know, just even for parents to, to understand these things. Look, I wish I had these principles when I was dating, when I was younger. I didn't have this, so uh, just, you know, for your own understanding, I didn't follow the principles I'm going to be teaching this morning. So in that regard, I'm a hypocrite, but I didn't know all of these things back when I was doing a lot of dating. So, um, it would have saved me a lot, a lot of uh, problems in my life if I would have known these things and followed these things. So uh, just, just take it for what it is here. Now in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse number 1, and before, before we get into that too, I just want to make a, a quick point here. The purpose of dating is to find a wife. And, you know, it sounds real simple, but especially in the culture that we live in today, I think there's a lot of instruction lacking and, and people just kind of are real flippant about marriage for one because people treat marriage as just glorified girlfriends and boyfriends as evidenced by the fact that divorce is just so rampant that people don't treat marriage with the gravity and sobriety that they ought to treat it as as you know when you decide to say I do or I will live with this person until death do us part for richer for poor you know in 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 poverty and in wealth and you know in good times and bad times and, and, and you know all of these promises that you're making like that is serious okay this is an event that should take place once in your life and you know God forbid you become widowed or something you could happen again but but this is one of those events that's basically designed to be a, a one-time event in your life it's designed to be, you do this once and there's no do-overs. There's no, oh wait, I made a mistake. It's, it's done. You're sealing something in, in that marriage. And it's a beautiful thing. It's a great thing. But we need to treat it with importance. And going all the way, starting with the dating, all the way through the marriage. Um, it, it is, it's a very, um, you know... Uh, sanctimonious thing it's 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 very um it, it ought to be elevated and respected in our marriage and it's and it's not these days so the purpose of dating isn't to find friends isn't just to hang out it's you're trying to find either a wife or a husband right i mean if you're dating you're interested in marrying somebody so just understanding that even before we get into scripture here 
because you know that it's forever, you're gonna wanna know who it is that you're planning on marrying. And one of the best things you can do in dating is to communicate a lot and get to know the other person. And um, this is something I actually did do before my wife and I got married, is um, talked a lot about your beliefs, your goals, where you want to be in life, what direction you want to take. You know, you, you don't, you want to make sure before you get involved, if you want to have a lot of children, but then the person you're interested in is like, I don't really want to have children. That's not something you kick down the road and say, well, we'll just deal with that later. Okay, because that is something that's, that's, that's at a core that can cause a lot of problems and a lot of strife. Or, you know, we could start off with the most basic thing, you know, I'm saved and I'm going to heaven, but this person I'm interested in is not saved and, you know, well, we'll just deal with that later. No, no, that is, that is the number one thing that you're going to need to make sure is established. And that's actually what the Bible puts on as far as marriage goes. You know, you can marry whom you will only in the Lord. And God gives us freedom and choice to, to go out and, and find someone that, that, that you love, someone you're attracted to, you know, whatever. But just, you're born again, make sure that they're born again. Make sure that they're saved because that goes to the, the a person's religion, a person's belief in God goes to the core of who a person is. And if you've got difference and variance there, that's not going to do any good for you. It's just going to cause problems. Um, so that's number one. Obviously, you're going to want to talk about other things. You know, if you're, if you're a man and, you're, and you, you, know, you believe that your wife should be at home and not working a job and raising the kids and you, you kind of have this, this understanding of, of how a, a marriage should work, talk about those things so that your wife isn't blindsided getting into something and being like, well, I had no idea that you wanted me to do this and this and this and this and this. So it's not just some big shock because that's, guess what? That's going to cause problems. And in something that you want to make sure works and make sure lasts and lasts forever and lasts until you die, you don't want to add any more problems up front because there will be enough problems <laughs> that come up on their own, okay? The most perfect marriage is everybody has problems. Everyone who's married, I see a lot of heads nodding and say, yep, <laughs> this is true. And when you choose to live with someone and stay married, you know, it, it's natural. We're human beings. There will be problems and things that come up. There will be fights. But we don't want to add to that, especially when you're getting started, right? So please try to take heed to all of the, the teachings this morning that are coming from the Bible. Um, and we're going to start here. Look at verse number one in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. The Bible says, Now concerning the things whereof ye wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. Now, keep your place here in 1 Corinthians 7, because we're coming back to it, and just turn to Proverbs chapter 5. And while you're turning there, I'm going to cover, these verses are very important because there's not a lot of places in Scripture that talk about various concepts. And what the Bible's explaining here is that one of the reasons to get married even is to avoid fornication. So what does that imply? That implies that a man and a woman have an attraction and appeal towards each other, right? You, you love each other. You want to spend time together. You want to be together. And in order to do things the right way, in order to make sure that you don't commit fornication and, and become one flesh outside of marriage, which is a very wicked sin, the way to solve this problem is to get married, to join together and commit to one another and say, we will stay together. Now, the reason I'm bringing this up is because in dating principles, I think one of the important things is to make sure you're attracted to the person that you intend to marry. Because it's bringing up here to avoid fornication, you want to have a wife. If you're not attracted to someone, there's probably not going to be as much of a concern about fornication if you don't even have an attraction to that person. 
And I'll tell you what, that attraction will be important just in general, and again, in helping your marriage to, so this isn't, you shouldn't look at marriage as just like some business deal or some contract of like, well, I just need to love my wife and she needs to, you know, and, and it's just, there's no emotion involved, or there's no love there or attraction. Uh, you're gonna wanna have that in your marriage. And, and what he's saying here is to, in order to avoid a fornication, let everyone have his wife. And in the verse preceding that, it says, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. So assuming you're dating somebody that you're attracted to, when you decide to start dating, you know what? It's good for a man not to touch a woman. Why? To avoid fornication. Because the other way to avoid fornication is then just to get married. But the more you get close to or touch or be intimate with, even without committing fornication, the more that's going to drive that, that desire to commit fornication. Okay, just being physical, touching, embracing, you know, holding hands. The, the more that you end up touching, the more that sparks are going to fly. Okay, and that's a fact, and that's a fact of nature, and you could say, no, that's not true. Yes, it is true. And we're going to go over fornication in a few minutes, and just so you understand how serious it is, this is something you want to make sure you keep yourself from at all costs. This is not an area you want to play around with. Okay, there's, there's, there are various levels or degrees of sin. There are. Sin, all sin is not equal. Just, just understand it. I think everyone here understands that. Not every single sin in the Bible is all equal. We want to make sure that we don't commit some really grievous sins definitely i mean we want to keep ourselves unspotted from the world we want to keep ourselves free from all sin but let you know if we're going to put time and emphasis on something let's make sure that we never commit fornication we never commit adultery we never commit these things and again as i said these are dating principles but hey you're married apply this to you instead of instead of using the word fornication use the word adultery In Proverbs chapter 5, verse number 20, the Bible says, And why wilt thou, my son, be ravished with a strange woman? A strange woman is someone that you don't know, someone who's foreign to you, and embrace the bosom of a stranger. So this is talking about embracing, right, what is that? It's a hug. And hugging the bosom, that's your chest, that's the front part of your body, that's a full-on front hug, Right? And he's saying, why will you embrace the bosom of a stranger for the ways of man are before the eyes of the Lord? And he pondereth all his goings. In the context here, especially in the book of Proverbs, you're going to see a lot of this. We're going to turn to Proverbs chapter 6. But um, there's warnings about the strange woman, the woman that you're not married to. And, and mostly in Proverbs, you're going to see it's adultery that, that we're being warned about. But you can swap these with fornication equally because the whole point is when you start embracing someone else and getting physically close to someone that can cause an attraction to start right there say you're married you love your spouse be careful okay i recommend not embracing the bosom of anyone who's not like a family member at all just to prevent just to keep away and to make sure you don't even get some temptation or some lust of your flesh fire up and spark up and then you start having wicked thoughts in your mind because you've embraced somebody and you held someone a little bit too close, you pulled them in a little bit too tight and now all of a sudden you feel something in your flesh that's wicked and wrong and that you should have nothing to do with. And it's those little sparks, those little triggers that lead people down the road to adultery that lead people down the road to fornication. And what oftentimes happens when it comes to dating is you start feeling these things, and then, what, as with all sin, you want to justify your sins. And probably one of the most common ways of justifying fornication for people who are dating is, is this. Well, we're going to get married anyways. Well, we're going we're gonna to stay together, so it's going to be okay, so... It's not that big of a deal if we just do this now. You know what? It is a big deal. 
If it wasn't a big deal, then God would just say, well, as long as you guys are planning on it sometime in the future, then it's not fornication. No, that's not the way God works. It is fornication when you're not married to lie with, a, with another person. That's it. Proverbs chapter 6, look at verse 23. Again, referring to you know, embracing the bosom or you know, this, this hugging and getting really close to someone. Proverbs 6, verse 23, the Bible says, For the commandment is a lamp, and the law is light, and reproofs of instruction are the way of life. Don't forget that. This is why I'm teaching this this morning. Reproofs of instruction are the way of life. We're looking to God's word to receive our instruction. Let's take heed to God's word. Verse number 24, to keep thee from the evil woman, from the flattery of the tongue of a strange woman. And again, we're seeing in the context here, this teaching is talking about an adulteress. This is talking about someone who's actually has it in her heart to commit adultery with a man. But we're going to see with the tactic and what this is referring to, there are truths that can be applied in a broader sense. Verse number 25, Lust not after her beauty in thine heart, neither let her take thee with her eyelids. For by means of a whorish woman, a man is brought to a piece of bread, and the adulteress will hunt for the precious life. By means of a whorish woman, a man is brought to a piece of bread. This just underscores how important this is because you can be destroyed, is what this is saying. I mean, you just could lose everything by means of a whorish woman, whether you're married or not, okay? Now, if you're married, that can destroy, I mean, that can, that can take everything away from you. If you allow a whorish woman, an adulterous woman, to, to catch your eye, for you to allow yourself to become flattered, and wow, this person really cares about me because she keeps on laying on, you know, compliments and speaking. And you know what, men especially, men and women though, this this works both ways. I don't even know how to say men especially, men and women. When you got someone of the opposite gender that starts giving you all these compliments and you're married, stop that communication right off the bat. Don't let it go any further. Now I'm not talking about just a, oh wow, you look nice today, right? You have to say, get away from me. I don't want to commit adultery, right? It's not, that's not what we're talking about. Okay, a normal compliment is fine. But when you notice that there's someone that just continually is looking at you and giving you just a lot of compliments, watch out for that. Because that is one of the ways that a whorish person will hunt for the precious life. They understand, you know, and guys especially can be very sneaky with this. Guys know this about women. Men know this, and men know what we're talking about, and sometimes women have a tendency to be naive and just think, oh, they're just being real nice. Don't be naive about this. If you have a man that's not your husband and you're married and just start laying on compliment after compliment, watch out for that. Have nothing to do with that. You know, Love your husband and love your marriage enough to just say, maybe I shouldn't talk to this person anymore. Or maybe I should just make it very clear that I don't want this communication to continue. It's worth it. It's worth your marriage. It's worth not being brought to nothing, to a piece of bread, to, to make that type of a stand for your marriage. Verse number 27 Excuse me, let's just read, read verse 26 again. For by means of a horse woman, a man is brought to a piece of bread, and the adulteress will hunt for the precious life. Can a man take fire in his bosom and his clothes not be burned? There's again another reference of embracing, taking fire into your bosom. When you embrace that stranger, that adulteress, whatever, you're taking fire into your bosom. And why is it referred to as fire? Because that's how lust burns. Lust burns like fire, uh, which we also see in 1 Corinthians as well. Go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 6 now. We're going to get back to chapter 7 in a minute, but go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. That's why I recommend for married and unmarried alike not to get involved with that close embracing and, you know, I get it. Sometimes there's people who want to do, you know, that they're, they're huggers, right? They want to come in. They want to hug. Nothing wrong with a handshake. 
or sometimes what I've done is do a, a side, right? Like this kind of sidestep and okay, <laughs> you know, you grab the shoulder. Good, right? You, you just don't want to, cause, why? Because you want to be careful not to have anything happen. Now you could say like, oh, but there, it's meaningless. And you know what? Maybe it is meaningless. Maybe there's nothing behind it. But what you're trying to avoid is a very, very serious problem or very, very serious sin. I'm not saying that every person that wants to give you a hug is an evil, wicked person. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is just using wisdom, trying to be wise to avoid these things at all costs and just make sure... Because does it really matter? Do you have to have that, that super close embrace? I don't, I don't think it's necessary. I think there's other ways of, of greeting people, showing you're happy to see them, than having to get really close to someone of the opposite gender that's, that you're not related to, that's not your, your spouse. And in, in the understanding, especially dating, with the understanding that there's an attraction there. There's already, you know, a desire to, to be with that person. Why make that desire even stronger by allowing yourself to come together so close? Okay? You're playing with fire. Now, I'm not saying it's impossible for a person to, to do that and not commit fornication, but we're talking about being wise. Okay? And I'm not saying that if a person hugs another person, it's a sin. Okay, I'm not saying that either. We're looking at principles here and how to avoid very serious sins, very serious sins, and to try to keep ourselves above reproach and in good standing with the Lord. So um, I'm, just, I'm trying my best here to, to get these good truths across. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, look at verse number 12. The Bible reads, All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Meats for the belly and the belly for meats, but God shall destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. So he's talking about, hey, all things might be lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. And, you know, he's talking about m multiple things, but it's lawful to eat all things, right? We know that, you know, he says in here, you know, we know that an that a idol is nothing, and if you eat things, sacrifice on idols, like, it's just food. Um, but it's, even though it's still a sin, though, to, to, to partake in that, um, all things are lawful. We're freed from the law in one sense, right? But we still need to not be brought under the power of sin and the bondage that goes along with it. It says, meats for the belly and the belly for meats, but God shall destroy both it and then. Now the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. Even though your body might crave that, that satisfaction that could go along with fornication, he says, that's not what the body was made for. The body is made for the Lord. And the Lord for the body and God hath both raised up the Lord and will also raise up us by his own power. Verse 15, know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ. Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of an harlot? God forbid. What? Know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body? For two, saith he, shall be one flesh. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Sinning through fornication. The Bible is trying to make this very clear about how big of a deal it is because the Bible is saying, look, your body is for the Lord. And when you join your body with someone else's, you're becoming one flesh, you're becoming a one body. And if you're committing fornication, it's like you're joining your body with a harlot or with a whore or what, you know, just, just something that, that is not intended the way God wanted it to be. How could you take the temple of, that, that God has given us, the, the, our body is our temple, the temple of the Holy Ghost. If you're, if you're a born-again believer today, the Holy Ghost is residing inside of you, which is the house or the temple of the Holy Spirit, which is within you, and you're going to take that temple and defile it with somebody else outside of marriage in fornication. Which is why he then continues on here in verse 18, flee fornication, because that's what he's talking about. Making your, your body membered with a harlot, making your body... 
uh, uh, join together outside of marriage, flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. If you love God, you want to do things the right way, you're going to want to make sure that you're not joining your body together with someone else and defiling your body and sinning against your own body and against the Lord in this manner. This is a very, very serious sin. Flip back to chapter 7 now. Chapter 7, verse number 8. The Bible says, I say, therefore, to the unmarried and widows, it is good for them if they abide even as I. What's he talking about? People who are not married, people who have been married, but they're widows now. He's saying, you know what? I think it's a good idea for you to be like me. And how was the Apostle Paul? He was unmarried. He dedicated his life to just preaching the gospel, being an evangelist, going out and just doing the work of the Lord. And in this chapter, he goes through the various benefits of just being unmarried anyways, of just saying, hey, you could dedicate all your time to serving God. You don't have to worry about anyone else because when you do get married, you do have to care for your spouse. So that is a distraction from just serving the Lord. Now, obviously, it's still not a bad thing. I mean, God created us this way. If we didn't have marriages and families, everybody would go extinct, right? So this isn't for everybody. And, and the Apostle Paul says, you know, this isn't for everybody. You know, everyone has their proper gift. He's just giving you, you know what? There's a lot of good that could come from just being single and just dedicating your entire life to serving God. And he's saying, you know what? It's good for you to abide even as I. Now, he wasn't a fornicator. He wasn't just going around and being a whorish man and, and sleeping around. He was keeping himself pure. But he says, just be like me, serve the Lord. He says, but if they cannot contain, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn. And that burning that he's talking about there is burning in your lust towards someone else. It is better just to get married if you can't contain. Why? Because this is such a, a, a strong desire within human beings to the vast majority of people, this desire to be with someone else is a very, very strong lust of your flesh. It is a desire that, that can be very difficult to contain. And especially when you're young, especially when, you know, with, with younger people, there's, there's growth and hormones and things going on that, that this desire is even stronger. And it's one of these things that can be very, very dangerous. And he's saying, you know what? If you feel like you can't contain, you just need to get married because you need to do it the right way because it's way better to get married than to just burn in your lust and then get caught up in fornication, things like that. So why am I going to spend so much time? It's because this is probably the core principle in dating that you want to keep yourself away from because this is the big danger. The big danger is the fornication. So in everything that you do, when you're deciding, what am I going to do? How, when I go out and, and take someone out, uh, if I go to see a man or a woman and we're going to go on a date, how is it that we are going to make sure that fornication isn't an option? Well, one is going to be by the lack of all of the touching because that's only going to ramp up the desire that's probably already there. The more intimate you get, the more you touch someone, the more it's going to be likely that you're going to be allowing your flesh to get those fleshly desires to get stronger and stronger. And you don't want that desire to overcome your spirit of, of doing what's right. And I'll tell you right now, that desire is a strong desire. The Bible's telling us, you know, about not being able to contain for a reason, because this is one of those desires that's stronger than most others, than most other sins. This one is, is very strong in many, many people. So um, we are looking at this as a way to decide what we do. Turn to Romans chapter 13. Understanding the importance of fornication and and. and trying to, to flee from it, make sure we have nothing to do with fornication, we are going to make our own rules for ourselves, okay? And this is where you have to make your own rules when you're dating or when you're married and you want to avoid fornication, avoid adultery. 
Um, I'll give you some examples, but you have to make these rules on your own. But the whole point is understanding the principle, understanding the truth, the main truth and the main focal point. How you do that is going to be up to you. And I said, you know, uh, there's going to be a lot of things that might not be a sinful action in and of itself, but it's definitely not wise to be involved in. Romans 13, verse number 12. The Bible says, The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. You want to make sure you've got good armor on when you're, when you're dealing with your flesh, especially, and you're getting in a situation, well, hey, maybe there's going to be a lot, of, a lot of lust burning there. I need to have the armor of light on. Let us walk honestly, verse 13, as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. And this is one of the key principles in dating and in keeping your marriage is not making a provision for the flesh, not giving your flesh opportunity to fulfill the lusts thereof. So what's one way you can make a, a, a provision for the flesh by being alone somewhere with someone else. Again, married or unmarried, you're married and you spend some time, like, think about this, okay? And, and this is why I don't do this, but what if I were to offer counseling here? There's nothing wrong with counseling. That's a good thing, right? I want to help people. Well, I have office hours and nobody's here. And some woman is having marriage problems and wants to talk to me to get some advice about her marriage. And I say, sure, come on in. And then she comes into a building and sits down in my office and it's just me and her alone. Does that, does that sound like a good idea to anybody? No. Now, even if, you know, I'm, which I am, not if, but, <laughs> you know, dedicated to my wife, not thinking anything's going to happen. But when you start getting yourself in these situations and you're, you're, you're creating an environment where, hey, something can happen. You don't want to have that even be an option, not even close. If you keep yourself in an environment where there's always eyes around, guess what? There is no opportunity for the flesh. When you are accountable just because there's always someone around, how is that going to happen? That's why I have rules in my marriage on what we do and, and what, who we allow into our house, when we allow people into our house, and things like that. We don't allow someone of the opposite gender to be in our house if we're going to be alone with that person. It just doesn't happen. We've had guests in our house before. And you know what? Sometimes this can be a problem too because you know, we've had someone stay with us that was a, a younger woman, unmarried, and we had to make sure that there's never a time where I am alone with this house guest. And it could be a little inconvenient because we, you know, if my wife needs to run to the store or something and I'm at home and at the time that was in, uh, in Arizona and I was working from home. So it just, there, there had to be something like, well, either she has to leave or I have to leave because we're not going to make it to where we're both just sitting in this house together alone. And it wasn't because I just have this problem of committing adultery on my wife. It's because I don't want to make any provision or any possibility at all, not just for myself to get involved in a situation, but also so that nobody can speak reproachfully about me either. That's another thing that you have to consider is that it's not just keeping yourself, that's the primary thing. You want to make sure it's not even possible for anything bad to happen, but you also need to consider your own testimony. There have been many pastors that have been slandered in the past that haven't done things wicked, but because they did have things like the office hours, like the times where they're behind closed doors, that's when the talk goes on. That's when there's an opportunity for an enemy to slander your name. Um, the Bible says in 1 Timothy 5.14, you have to turn there. I will, therefore, that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. So we don't want to give the adversary, the enemy, an opportunity to speak reproachfully against us, even if you are doing good. And I'll give you an example of, of a time where I failed this in my dating with my wife. 
it was wrong. It was foolish. It, I should have never done it, but this is something I did. And hopefully you could learn from this not to do this. Because at the time, I was an older man. I mean, I was, what, 30 years old, 29, 30, something like that when we were dating. And um, I allowed my then girlfriend to sleep in my house. I owned a house. I owned a three-bedroom house. It was just me living there. I didn't have any roommates. No one else was there. It was just me. And I had extra rooms, right? So I'm thinking, well, hey, you know, you're on this side of town. You want to crash at my house? That's fine. You can stay at my house. Bad idea. Now, nothing happened as far as, you know, there was no fornication committed that night. But it was a struggle. And I'll tell you what, it, you know, like, if, if you know, <laughs> talking to my wife later, if I would have done something, if I would have made an advance, she wouldn't have stopped it. Because the opportunity was there. And, and you need to be careful and not give yourself the opportunity. Now, nothing ended up happening, thank God. However, what if someone would have noticed, oh, hey, there's this girl going into Brother Dave's house in the evening. And look, her car's there all night. Now, what would you think if you saw that? You don't want to have that type of a testimony. You need to guard yourself. And look, I, like I said, I've made mistakes. I'm, I'm, I'm you know, not happy to admit it, but I will admit it. So I'm not the, the, you know, the perfect person standing up here, but that doesn't change right from wrong. That doesn't change how you ought to, how you ought to um, have rules. And you know what? My rules have definitely changed over the years as I've learned and grown and understood more. And that's why we have the rules that we have. We don't even... Um, we don't even give rides to people of the, you know, like I don't pick up women to even come to church if it's just me. What I'll do is I'll have kids with us. I'll bring like my two oldest daughters or something like that with, not the little baby infant, right? I'm going to bring the oldest kids with me to keep that accountability so that, there, hey, there's, there's other people here, right? It's not just me. And you know what? This is good advice even for out soul winning. Men, you go out soul winning and there's a, a woman at the door and says, well, hey, why don't you come inside? Bad idea. Bad idea. You don't want to be, first of all, falsely accused of anything. You go inside that house or that apartment or whatever and the door shuts and it's just you and a woman alone in an apartment. Bad idea. You're making provision for the flesh. People can look at what you're doing, talk bad about you and talk reproachfully. About, about you and your character. And, you know, maybe she's going to lie about it. You don't know. That is just a recipe for disaster. Now, does that mean if that happens that it's automatically going to be bad? No, but hey, let's, let's use some wisdom here and use some discretion and, and keep ourselves above reproach in all matters. That is the theme. You know, I'm really trying to stress these principles. Uh, it's good to have chaperones. It's good to have other people around when you're dating to make sure that you're not making that provision for the flesh. Now, um, I think I'm going to skip this point. Let's, I'm going to make one more point before I'm done with this. Let's turn to Genesis chapter 24. So when it comes to dating, I'm going to try to rack my brain now through things like just some real, based on these principles, right? What's a good idea to do? A good idea is to not have a date in your home, right? Where it's just the two of you alone. Bad idea. You're making provision for the flesh. Go somewhere public. 
invite someone to go along with you where you can still spend some time. Obviously, you want to be able to, to, to talk and get to know one another when you're dating because that is important, as I mentioned before, to kind of know who you're getting get involved with. But, but do, you could do so out to dinner somewhere, out in a public place where there's other people around. You could keep yourself accountable, but still have an opportunity to speak. I mean, this is the way that I'll provide counseling for people as well. Um, Especially if it's if there's a you know some woman or something that that needs that needs help with something for some reason, um, it's going to be oh yeah, let's step over here while there's everybody here. You right? I mean you can have a conversation that is private in a sense, but still not without earshot. And you know when it comes to uh, when it comes to that specifically, my wife is always going to be present. So if any woman wants to have a, has any need for counseling, you could better believe that my wife is going to be involved with that because I'm not even going to allow for there to be talk of, hey, what was being said over there? Don't want it to happen. So um, again, you, you could interchange the, the marriage or dating. It's the same type of principle. It's based upon the same principle of avoiding fornication, keep yourself above reproach. Um, but, but lastly, the last point I make is um, a little bit different, but um, when it comes to how long should you date somebody before getting married, there is no set time in the Bible. So there, there, I'll tell you right off the bat, you know, I've studied this, there is, there is no like you need to date someone for this amount of time because it's different for everybody. It is different for everybody. But I will just warn this and encourage this that you take enough time and not be in a rush to do something when you're making such a large commitment. But let's, let's look at two examples here of in, in the book of Genesis of people that got married, one very quickly and the other one, not so quickly. And they're, they're, they're kind of extremes here. Genesis 24, look at verse number 64. The Bible says, And Rebekah lifted up her eyes, and when she saw Isaac, she lighted off the camel. For she had said unto the servant, What man is this that walketh in the field to meet us? And the servant had said, It is my master. Therefore she took a veil and covered herself. Okay, okay and, and you know what? This wasn't in my notes, but here she is. She's meeting a man that she was brought there, you know, with the purpose of marrying. And what type of, of uh, level does she take for just trying to keep modest and keep pure and to keep things? She puts a veil over. Her. She, she, you know, she's kind of, she's covering herself. She's not, you know, however she was uncovered, I'm, you know, it doesn't exactly say, but she took, well, she took a veil. The veil is going to be covering her face. And it says, and the servant told Isaac all things that he had done. And Isaac brought her into his mother Sarah's tent and took Rebekah and she became his wife and he loved her. And Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. So this appears to be pretty fast. We don't know the exact time frame of, of, you know, him getting to know her or anything like that. But this was kind of a special situation too. Because Abraham wanted his son to marry, not to marry a heathen person. That was an important principle for him. But God had also told him not to go back into the land where his family was, where, where there were other people that, that would be good options for his son to marry from. So Abraham is trying to keep all of God's commands basically in order here and in line so that he's not going back and breaking, you know, sinning by, by going back into the land to find someone for his son. And he's not allowing his son to marry someone that's some heathen woman in a heathen land. So the way that he gets through this and navigates this is by sending a servant to go and to find, help find a wife for his son. So again, you know, this is, there, there's all of these will have their own unique situations, but the amount of time spent here doesn't seem that long. But we know that Rebecca was willing. She's like, "Yep, I, I, you know, I'm willing to go," and um, and everything worked out well for them. Genesis 29, we're going to see here with Jacob and Rachel. Jacob and Rachel had a, had a little bit longer time period that they spent before they got married. And Genesis 29, verse number 18, the Bible says, and, and Jacob loved Rachel and said, I will serve thee seven years for Rachel, thy younger daughter. 
And Laban said, It is better that I give her to thee than that I should give her to another man. Abide with me. And Jacob served seven years for Rachel. And they seemed unto him but a few days for the love he had to her. And that's kind of an important note there I want to make is that even though Jacob waited seven years to get married, I believe he was, he was working and establishing himself. He probably wasn't ready because he just went into a, a foreign land, basically, and, and went to, to stay with relatives, but he wasn't established yet on his own, and I think he was going to make sure that he could provide for a wife, which is why he had to work the seven years in order to make sure he was going to be able to uh, fully provide for his wife and, and family that he wanted to have. And he was doing things that way. But seven years, but even though it was a full seven years, he said it really just seemed to him like a few days just because he loved her so much. Because he was working for her. He knew what the outcome was going to be. He had the patience. And when it was all said and done, it really wasn't that big of a deal. And I'm not saying that you have to date for seven years before you get married. I'm not saying that I think that that's the, the right time frame. And I'm not saying that you get married after one day either. Okay, it's going to be different. It's going to, however long it's going to take you to get to know somebody, you know, when you decide that this is right. All I'm stressing here is that marriage is serious. You know, the Bible doesn't have a set time frame on it. It might take you a year. It might take you a month. It might take you a week to determine that this is right. But you don't want to get involved in marriage with just some I want to say it just, just based on emotion. Emotion is important. It needs to be there, right? There needs to be interest and desire for the person. But take the time to get to know the person also because in the end, that is, that is going to get you through as well. Understanding the person, knowing the person, loving the person for everything about them, not just their vain beauty, right? Because beauty is vain. You ought to be attracted to the person, but that shouldn't be all that you love about your spouse or your potential spouse is just... Well, they're beautiful on the outside. Get to know that person. You're, you're investing your whole life with one person. That is, this is one area, you know, I don't know about you. I've had areas where like, man, I wish I would have listened to someone giving me advice because I ended up just forsaking that advice and doing the wrong thing and just kind of wishing I did things different. This is one area where you don't want that to be the case because it is you know, so permanent because it's something that lasts for so long and it's so important. It's, it's one of these things in your life. This is an area where you want to be fasting and praying and making sure that you're doing, you know, you're doing the right thing because you're committing yourself. So I hope that helps. You know, I cannot stress enough the purity portion of, of, of doing things the right way to avoid the, the potential fornication and just getting to know someone. You know what? Marriage is a great thing. And you find someone, you find a, 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 a wife that's, that's precious, that's great. You know, that's, that's a great gift from God. And I am all for marriage. I love marriage. I, want, I can't wait for people to get married in our church in general. But you know what? I can wait. <laughs> I think as long as, it is, you know, when it's deemed right, I'm not, I'm not trying, I don't like trying to tell people what to do, but there is godly wisdom and counsel, and I think that needs to be followed in general. And young people, you may feel like, um, you may feel a certain way. Make sure it's not just an emotion and that it's also, you know, you've spent the time getting to know that person as best you can. And I'll say this for the ladies, too, especially for the, for the girls. You know, the Bible talks about, and this is, I, I had this point here. I'm not going to go in depth on it. Getting, you know, approval from your parents, especially if your parents are godly, you know, and looking out for you, because your parents are supposed to be there to look out for your best interests. Uh, there's a reason why there are traditions and, and the traditions of marriage and, you know, a father giving a daughter away. There's, there's a very important reason for that. That is biblical and scriptural. Because the Bible talks in the book of Numbers about um, people committing a, a vow. And if a, if, a, if a daughter is in her father's house 
and is cared for by her father, that her father has the right to disallow vows made before the Lord. And what are you doing when you're getting married? You're making a vow to be with another man and going from the authority of your father and your father's house to being the authority of, of, a, of a husband. And God has put an emphasis on fathers, you know, making sure that their daughters are cared for. And you know why it's important? Because men know men. Men understand other men and men are going to be able to see through oftentimes you know, another man who might just be buttering up their daughter and is really just a snake and not going to be good for them. So, you know, fathers, make sure you're diligent, especially when you have daughters, about getting to know who your daughter's interested in and guiding and directing your daughter. And daughters, you know, listen to those that love you that care for you. If maybe, maybe your dad's not in the picture, but you have someone that's, that's like a dad to you, you know, that, that has your interests at heart, listen to their advice. And, and don't just forsake that. Because, like I said, men know men, and, and dads need to watch out for their daughters. And um, you don't want to be like, like Esau. Esau heard, because what was going on with Isaac and, and Rebekah, they, heard, they, they were talking about Isaac or about uh, Jacob. You know, Rebekah's like, I don't want Jacob to, to go and, um, and marry some heathen girl. I want her to marry a godly person, someone from our family, you know, just, just, just someone who's right with the Lord. I, I, want, I want him to marry the right person. Esau heard that. And in his bitter heart, you know what he did? He went and just married an Ishmaelite. He just went and married someone because he knew his parents didn't approve of certain women, that he saw his brother was doing the right thing. So he's like, you know what? I'm just going to go and marry this Ishmaelite to kind of to spite his parents. And kids, you know, it, when you're young, you might have the, you know, there's a spirit of rebellion. Oftentimes you think you know better than everybody else. But when someone loves you and is looking out for you, don't make a decision, like especially something that's that, that important out of spite like Esau did. Obviously, Esau's a really a, a, an example of, of, of someone doing a lot of wrong things and for the wrong reasons. And he, had, he acted impulsively and he gave himself in to, to lusts with, you know, with selling his birthright and all kinds of other things. And even in that, that example, you could read it for yourself in the book of Genesis, how he just said, oh, well, they want Jacob to do this, and he's, and he's listening to them, obeying. Well, I'm going to go and do the opposite. Don't have that type of an attitude. Try to find the right person. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for all the biblical instructions that you give us. God, I pray that you please help us all to institute uh, good rules for ourselves to just make sure that we're guarded, that we have on the armor of light, to just protect us from, from our own flesh, from, from the desires of our flesh, Lord. In this world, we're going to look, be looked at, you know, what I've taught on today is probably going to be viewed as crazy and that we're just nuts and that we're too uptight. But Lord, we understand the value. We can see the bigger picture. I understand the, the sanctity of marriage, Lord, and the importance of marriage and of the family, and, and that we need to guard these things and they need to be sacred to us. And uh, we, we ought to be very careful with such things. And um, Lord, help us to be wise and, and not to, to forsake godly counsels. In Jesus' name we pray.